Okay, so so Tina and I know each other pretty well. Um, but I'll just give you the introduction for everyone else that doesn't know you. Okay. Um, so you're the director of the Center of Diversity and Inclusion at Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, and so today we'll be talking about the Four Directions Summer Research Program um, at Harvard Medical School, uh, which supports undergraduates uh, who have committed uh, who have commitment to the health of Native American communities, and then also your work with um, the the Center of Diversity and Inclusion. Yes. So can I share my slides, Cameron, or? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you so much. It's great yeah. to see you. Um, okay, give me one second to pull them up. Uh, here we go. I hope everyone's having a good day. It's always weird on the webinar because I can't, I can only see you and I can't see anyone else, but I know you're out there because there's 80, 78 people. Um, but thank you so much. Cameron for, um, for organizing this and uh, the full group who uh, put this Native American Health Policy Symposium together. This is just truly amazing. And it's a real honor for me to be here to present on the Four Directions Summer Research Program. My name is Tina Gelsomino. I use the she, her, hers series of pronouns. I'm the Senior Director at the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. And our mission really at the center is to provide uh, an environment where people can thrive um, to create a diverse community of faculty, trainees, and students. And um, today I'm going to be focusing on our Four Directions Summer Research Program um, that brings Native American students to the Brigham for the summer to have a lab experience. And, and I think to really understand Four Directions, um, you really need to go back into time. So we're going to go back to 1994, uh, which is actually when Four Directions started, which is actually really, really amazing in itself that the program has been around for 27 years. Um, I don't know if anyone here um, that I'm looking at through my computer um, camera um, does uh, program program programmatic uh, pathways programs like this, but as you know, they're, they require a tremendous amount of commitment, a tremendous amount of really good staff, um, and a real continuity of um, of people, but not only that, but resources, financial, um, as well as infrastructure. So I just want to say off the bat, the fact that this program has still existed for 27 years just shows um, so, so much commitment on the, on behalf of the people who started the program, who I'm going to talk about in a second, as well as um, the commitment um, of, the, of Brigham and HMS um, over the years. So this is a beautiful picture of Boston. I don't know where all of you are out there, but here we are in beautiful Boston. It's actually a beautiful day today. So this is kind of what Boston looks like. Um, but we're gonna go back into time. We're gonna go to 1994, which is when Four Direction started. And this is a picture, if you've ever been to Harvard Medical School, this is like the Gordon Hall, which is like the big, beautiful marble building. Um, and there's this beautiful lawn. Um, and um, to start, uh, we had three Native American students, um, Brent Hale, Patrick Linson, and Wombly Sean Franklin, who launched the Four Directions program in 1994, and they accepted six uh, college students uh, to come and do this, um, this lab experience. And then uh, the year after that, in 1995, two first-year students, uh, one who you, I'm both you probably familiar with, but one you might be very familiar with, um, Dan Kallick and Tom Sequest, who is uh, still um, at the Brigham and at uh, Mass General Brigham, uh, both first years began uh, to lead the program um, in 1995. And um, as many of you know, Tom is still in charge of the Four Directions program um, 27 years later. Not to make us feel old, Tom, because we're not. Um, we're very young. So um, that's where it all started. And I actually went back and I found this article from 1995 about the Four Directions program. So I thought I would put that in. But that's how the program started. Um, and since that time, you know, Four Directions has really become a real model in terms of uh, a pathways programs to support Native American students as they per pursue careers in the medical field and the sciences and health professions. And approximately two thirds of our alumni have pursued graduate school, um, including medical and public health degrees. So um, it's been really successful and I'll show you some of the data a little bit later on in the program. Um, okay, so I'm gonna also shameless plug because we actually run not only Four Directions, but we also run another summer program um, in tandem with Four Directions called STARS. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a quick rundown of the numbers. So uh, our focus is on UIM Indigenous college students, 
um, and first-year medical students um, for an eight-week mentored summer lab experience. And we'll get into the details about what that all means in just a minute, but I want to give you an overview. So we've got STARS, which has been running 11 years, which is pretty, pretty amazing too. We have over 100 alumni there and a rating of consistently four out of five. Sometimes it's five out of five, just depends on the year, but the average is four, and a, four stars out of five. That's the from the program evaluations we get back. And then Ford Directions has been running for 27 years. We have over 200 alumni. And again, we consistently receive uh, rave reviews from the students, the lab mentors that we work with, uh, just a plug for them. Some of the lab mentors we've had, we've had for, for years. So for, for 10 years, 11 years, you know, since the program started, we've had the same lab mentors come back every year. So there's a deep commitment um, on, on the part of the uh, lab mentors as well. And we really couldn't do this program without them. So just want to give a quick shout out to all the lab mentors out there that support us every year. Um, so we have 16 summer students come in total. Um, eight for four directions, eight for stars. Um, and the, the real mission, um, as I said, is really to train the next generation of leaders in Native American healthcare. So uh, we're going to get into how exactly we try to prepare students for that, but we do uh, sort of uh, a holistic approach. So we do that through mentoring, guidance, networking, hands-on research experience, um, we, all sorts of seminars for them. They meet lots of different people at the Brigham while they're here and lots of different disciplines. We do some coaching with them around presentation skills and styles and um, abstract work and all of those types of things. So they feel really hopefully more prepared um, uh, when they leave. So that's our mission. And there's actually, I have a bunch of pictures. It was actually really fun. I got to go back and look at all the old photographs um, and this is a this is a picture of our, some of our students in the lab um, uh, back in I think it was nineteen oh no 20, 2019. I think this is a group from twenty nineteen. Okay, so program goals are fourfold. So we have sort of tools, exposure, research, community. So the tools are the information we think the students are going to need, the opportunities that they're going to need on this journey to become physicians, researchers, and public health officials, and really uh, professionals, and really help support them in that. Um, we also want to provide exposure to Native American health and minority health policy issues um, more broadly, so they have a deeper understanding of that um, from that perspective. We want to um, provide them with a cutting-edge research experience with a dedicated lab mentor, um, the lab mentors that we had, as I said, they're amazing, but they're also some of the top people in their field. So, you know, imagine a college student coming and getting to work with like the top person in a field and getting to do their own research project. It's, it's pretty amazing. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the research projects they work on in, in a minute. Um, and then community. Uh, community is really important. It's not just a top down, like who are you going to meet at the Brigham who could write a recommendation? It's also the community of other students that they're with. And I mean, both the Four Direction students and the STAR students, they really, really bond together. They live together while they're here um, and they really bond and they form deep and lasting connections. Um, and we have, most of our alumni are, are in touch with another um, student that they were in FDSRP with like many years later. Um, and so those are the kinds of bonds that um, we want them to form while they're here um, in the program. Um, any, does anyone have any questions so far? I don't see any in the Q&A, so. All right, I'm gonna take the silence as I'm gonna keep going. And then if there are questions at the end, we can, we can get to those. Okay, so structure of the program. So it's in person, it's eight weeks. So we start this year, it's June 6th. Uh, it runs to July 29th. Um, so we are, of course, in a flurry of activity to get our students onboarded and make sure that they can start on June 7th in their labs. There's a whole bunch of preparation that takes place in the background. Um, but I think what we really strive to do on the team, on, the C on my team and CDI, is make it seamless. So even though there's all of this work and preparation going on in the background, I just the students shouldn't see any of that. It should just be like, here's your information. You're going to this lab. We're going to take you there and then sort of set them on their way. So um, 
part of having like a really good programming experience is having a real understanding of logistics. And I know that sounds like really nuanced and sort of nitpicky, but it's actually super important. And so we're always looking at all the details from everything from who's going to get them at the airport to who's going to greet them when they arrive at their dorm to like what what you know what kind of pizza are we going to get the first night for them like there are like things that are super duper important and making sure that they have like a really seamless experience so the program's full time um so it's 40 hours a week in the lab unless they have uh, like a talking circle or a circle up for stars so those are uh, weekly meetings that they have with the program director so tom sequest or monique jimenez who uh, is the program director for stars and it's a one hour sort of check-in they talk as a group about different things that are happening or uh, different issues that might come up or um, just to check in and have a touch point um, so we did run this we did actually run both of our summer programs last year virtually because of COVID. And I will say after running them virtually, and I don't know if Tom Sequest is here, but he might have a thought on it as well as what, what he thought, but I think we did okay, given the fact that we had never run it virtually and we had to completely transform the program. And I think for the students to truly get the everything they can out of it, it really does need to be an in-person thing. So obviously we couldn't help that last year because of COVID, but we're really excited to be able to let you know that we're doing it in person again and we're really really excited to have all 16 of our students back um so that's the structure of the program and then the sort of key activities so we have the mentored research experience so we have them so we're just about to match them actually so we're just we just got all of our lab mentors um so we have 16 lab mentors eight for four directions and we're just about to match the students to the lab mentors and then um there's also oh, typically a senior postdoc in each lab who really takes the student under their wing and like really, really works with the state student at day to day. But the, the senior PI is also there, meets with the students at least three times. Um, we like it to be like once a week, but three times. And then they're in the lab all summer um, working on their research and they work on a specific project. Um, and then they, they actually report out the results of that project at a symposium where all of the lab mentors come, all of their staff comes, CDI goes, other faculty comes. I'm gonna see if the president of the Brigham can come at least for a few of the um, symposiums this year. So senior leaders come and they listen to the presentations and they do not hold back. Like the questions the students get, like they're prepared to answer highly technical scientific questions. And it's truly amazing to see them um, to, to see them do this, uh, you know, after eight weeks, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to see. So they have this mentored research experience, which is the sort of bread and butter of the program. And then they also have all of these other pieces of program that sort of add on to the top. Um, so we've got this career development faculty series. So we often ask um, our faculty to come and do a one hour session with the students and usually focused on a particular topic. So something in minority health policy or health equity or something like that. We have different um, people in different disciplines come and talk with the students. And that's really fun for them to get to meet all of the different um, the different leaders doing research and faculty at the Brigham. Um, then we have the talking circle, which is this meeting that happens once a week with the students and the program director, and it's their chance to sort of decompress, talk about issues that have happened during the week, maybe have a particular thing they're focused on, and it's their time to sort of check in and have that time um, with their program director. And then we also have a clinical shadowing experience. And I have to say, if you're interested in running one of these programs, the, re re the mentored research experience is the sort of the key component, but boy, do the students love clinical shadowing. So we spend hours setting up clinical shadowing for them so they can have a day experience with a surgeon or a radiologist and they actually get to shadow that person in their clinic or you know neurosurgery or something like that so it's really fun for the students they love clinical shadowing so very popular um, and it's really great for them and then we also do a series of social and networking events. So um, on the weekends, we set up like a duck tour for them, baseball game. Um, also, they Harbor Islands, sometimes we do that, bowling, movie night, they go to the 4th of July fireworks at the Esplanade. So there's like a bunch of social things that happen as well. Um, and then the other thing we do is we try to connect the students with the other um, Native American um, 
re- faculty and trainees that we have at the Brigham. So um, we've been very fortunate to have uh, a growing group um, of Native American faculty and trainees. And so we're really hoping that um, those trainees and faculty will come back and meet with the students and maybe do a session on, you know, I don't know, how to get into medical school, how do you get into residency, those kinds of things that the students are really interested in. And they, I think it's really, my observation is it's very important for them to see the person in the next step above them. Um, I think that's really powerful and meaningful to them. And so we really try to bring, bring that together as well. So our program provides housing. So eight weeks of housing. So they are housed um, a few blocks away. Um, it's actually a great place to live in Boston. Boston's really expensive. So we they're at the Mass Art dorms, which are just about three or four blocks from the hospital. So they can just walk up the street, go to their labs. They don't need to take the tea or anything, but we do provide transportation. So they have housing for eight weeks. They have a stipend that they receive um, for the program. Um, I think it's about I think it's $5,000 this year. And then they get transportation to and from Boston. And we also provide them with a T-pass so they can get around the city, you know, on the weekends and things like that. And then, as I mentioned, we do a bunch of social activities with them, all sorts of things. Here's some of our students at a Red Sox game, which they always love to go to. Um, It's really fun if you've never been to a Red Sox game. They're actually really fun and students really seem to like them a lot. Um, So... Now I'm going to talk a little bit about, so I mentioned that they do these, they all have a research project. And so I was going through the list of the different ones. And um, so I'm not a, I'm not a a scientist by training. Um, So when they start talking about like splicing DNA and all that, they sort of lose me a little bit, but I always try to ask a question at the end. So these are some of the projects that they've worked on over the years. So quantitative trait, low loci, genetic analysis, I'm not even sure I'm seeing these, right, circadian rhythm and sepsis, you can see they're, you know, doing highly sophisticated work. um, And it's really amazing to see them. um, And, you know, they just, they just sort of thrive in the environment. It's, it's really awesome. And it's always fun to see them at the symposium. They always get really nervous before they present, but then once they're up there, they're really good. And they just sort of, they just sort of do it. And, you know, they don't seem nervous at all. So it's always really fun to see them at the beginning and then in the middle and then at the end of the program. Um, so this is just some of the, um, the different topics they have worked on over the years. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about, so we do an alumni survey every few years and I just wanted to share a little bit um, of the data with you. Um, so this is just a wordle on the right-hand side, just of all of the tribes. Um, that we've we've been able to um, support along the way with our program and all the students and all the different tribes they come from. So it's pretty amazing um, the, the the diversity there. So typically in a cycle, we receive between 50 and 60 applications per year. Sometimes it's higher. This year we received about 55. And so we have eight spots. And so it's not an easy thing to sort of decide who's going to be in the program. Um, we often you know, spend a lot of time agonizing about who's who's going to get one of the spots. Um, and we have 227 program alumni representing over 80 different tribes, 35 states, 100 colleges and universities all over the country. And I said at the beginning that two thirds of our alumni have at least two thirds um, have pursued graduate degrees, including medical school and public health degrees. Um, and 20% of our alumni have completed or enrolled in a medical school. So just wanted you to see some of the data that we have on the strength of the program. Um, I think I mentioned uh, a little while ago, they, they really form strong bonds with each other. Um, here's a picture. So we actually take them the second day they arrive, we get white coats for all of them and we bring them over to Gordon Hall, which is that big, beautiful building I showed you at the beginning and we get a picture in front of it. And I, we give a copy of the picture of this picture to them uh, and their lab mentor and anyone who helped them in the lab at the end in like a picture frame. But so um, we actually have pictures from 27 years in f- frames someplace in the, in the they're, they're somewhere, um, someplace in the office now, but are you currently in touch with other FDSRP alum? And I just wanted you to see this because over 90, you know, 90, about 90% of people are. And I think that speaks to the, just the bonding that occurs between, um, between the students. Um, that they're still in touch with each other um, after all of these years. And then would you recommend FDSRP to others? And as you can see, 
from the data that we have, 100% said they would. Um, this picture here is taken, um, there's a dinner at the end of FDSRP where all the lab mentors come and their postdocs come and there's a big dinner and there's certificates and the students get to say something and there's like little speeches and everything and they take pictures at the end. This is a great picture of them getting like a group selfie together, which I, I love that picture. And then, um, you know, just some testimonials about the program. So it gave me the inspiration to continue the path of academics. Um, it played a major role in me becoming a physician, making lifelong friends. Um, if I didn't, if it weren't for FDSRP, I don't know if I had the experience, contacts, or recommendations I needed to get into medical school. It was enlightening for me. I'm grateful for the kindness and the stellar teaching of my lab, as well as supportive, inspiring friends that I've met. Um, so this is just some of the feedback that we've heard from, from the students. Um, and I'm just about done and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, so if you're, if this has inspired you to think about starting your own FDSR program, we certainly need more than the Brigham's program. We need lots more of these pathways programs for, um, native and indigenous students. And so I, I'm happy to talk with anyone who'd be interested in that, but there are some things you're going to need to start out with. Um, first you're going to need strong leadership support to be able to keep the continuity of something like this going. And we've um, been fortunate to have that and Tom and the other founders of the program, as well as lots of people um, who've advocated to keep it running for 27 years. You're going to need a financial commitment. So um, for our program, it costs about $100,000 to run the program. Um, so 200000 total if you include our other program stars. And then you're going to need at least one full-time project coordinator an eight week intern, and you're probably gonna need some other kind of administrative person to help. Um, and I will say that the administrative support person is actually really crucial because although the students are in lab and they're meeting with um, the program directors, the, admin, and the administrative coordinator for the program is the person they'll go to and they, they do coaching with the students as well. And they sort of know everything that's going on with the students. So if something comes up for a student that's personal and they help the student with that, although also talk with Tom about how we can support the student as well as the lab. And so that person has to be not only strong logistically, they have to be strong in, in a, um, and very professional and able to manage um, a lot of, um, a lot of different issues that will come up over the summer. It doesn't always happen, but sometimes inevitably there's something that will happen, you know, a parent gets sick or something's going on at home and it can be really stressful for the student. And so, you know, this isn't just a program about science, it's also about people. And so we try to support the whole person. And so if someone's having an issue, we really encourage, this, encourage the student to let us know so we can help them through it. And hopefully we've, we've done that job um, over the years. Um, and then some kind of, pro, you know, a program director. So you'll need at least a part-time person uh, and dedicated to that eight weeks. That's really the intense time for the person who's going to be managing the program. So they sort of need to be really available over those eight weeks. And then, uh, you know, people think sometimes that these programs just like end in August and then we just forget about it until June when we, but to run a program like this, you're doing work all year long. So there's a maybe a three week break in August, but you're probably sending out an alumni survey or finishing up program evaluations. And then in September, you're starting the whole cycle all over again with updating marketing materials and making sure you have contest lists for everything and then getting your applications ready. Then you're getting your applications and you're reviewing your applications on your onboarding students. So there's a lot that goes into this behind the scenes. That's not part of the eight weeks to make it really seamless. So um, again, I'm happy to talk um, afterwards. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm happy to sort of just tell you more about it. Um, but I do want to, before I take questions, I do want to just do some acknowledgements. So uh, first, I want to thank the um, for the founders of FDSRP, for which we have no program, and I would not be here speaking with you. So thank you. Um, big shout out to Tom, Dr. Sam, Tom Sequest, who is a program director and has been for a very long time. And we really appreciate all of his dedication and support to the students and the program and helping us um, make sure that these students have a great experience. Um, FDSRP alumni network and our student scholars. So anyone who's come through the program and takes our survey every time we send it. And we know it's really long, but we appreciate it. You letting us know where you are, and what you're doing. Lab mentors, past, present, and future. 
Um, we've received um, generous support from foundations and corporations over the years. So Sunhill, Aetna, and Further Forward Foundations have all been supportive um, with gifts to help us run the program. Center for Diversity and Inclusion staff and research administration and the chief academic officer um, have also been incredibly supportive and instrumental in us running the program. Uh, our current uh, program coordinator, Fred Matthew, and all of our past program coordinators are really the glue that like makes this all run. So we really need a strong person in that role. And then I just take an opportunity to thank the organizers of this Native American Health Equity Symposium and thank you for the invitation to present Four Directions and um, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much. Yeah, Tina, thank you very much. Um, thank yeah, so you. I'm looking forward to all the student talks in, is it a few weeks in a month? Yes, the, yeah, the students, uh, so there, I will send you a calendar invite, <laughs> but yes, um, the seminars will be a weekly uh, from June through July, and then also there's the symposium at the end, which is really fun where you get to actually see their, all their presentations, um, so I'll make sure I send that along, and oh, to anyone else who wants it. Good. Um, yeah. yeah. We do have a few questions. So I think that one important part um, is a lot of these Native communities are kind of isolated and may not know about this experience. So how yeah. do you go about advertising for this program? So we have a, a alumni list and we also have a contact list that is like carefully curated. We also have a lot of connections at um, many colleges and universities where we know that um, Native American students attend. And uh, we use Handshake, which is really great, which is this online platform where you can actually post your program. And then um, colleges and universities can um, look to see what's available and then they can take that and, and bring that to their students. So we sort of have like a threefold approach, but I'm always open to other people's ideas because, you know, marketing is, a, is, is sort of always moving and we lose contacts and things like that. So we try to keep up with it. But if there are other um, contacts, um, and I see one here in the chat. Um, thank you, Raquel. Yes, I will add you. Um, I'm happy to hear those, but that's, um, that's typically how we do our marketing. And then we do it directly through colleges and universities that we know. Okay, right, great. Yeah. Also, the other question that people had is, um, so since you, you know you have so many applicants, you can only have yeah. so many slots, you know, how do you decide, um, you know, who should get selected for any given year? Yeah, it's really, really hard. So we have a combination of how we do it, you know, so we look um, mm -hmm. to see, you know, first we look at, you know, um, you know, if they've done like what kind of lab work, you know, what kind of courses they've done, how much lab experience have they have they had, um, you know, their commitment, there's a, a application and part of that is your commitment to Native American health. And so you have to um, show, you know, how what your commitment is and or what it will be. So that's a huge part of the um, of the process. Um, and then we look at, you know, standard things like grades, um, courses, uh, there's a personal statement. And I actually have to say for me, the personal statement is actually really, really important because I feel like if you phone in a personal statement, we're gonna know and it's, you know, like these students are all excellent, right? The, there's a, they're, they're all at a, like, a, they're all excellent, right? So there's gotta be something that makes you stand out. And I feel like the personal statement is a great way to do that. And so for me, the personal statement is really important and that commitment to Native American health and health policy is also really helpful in sort of seeing the whole person. Um, so we look at the full application and then we, you know, we usually pick like a group um, of students to look at and then we kind of go from there to determine who gets into the program. And we also look at things like geographic location, you know, are we having like a diverse group of people coming from different tribe, tribal affiliations and things like that as we sort of make the decision. Um, yeah, it's always tough when you want to give the opportunity to everyone, uh, but it's only so yeah. much possible. Right? I wish yeah. I could take all 50. I really do, but I would need about 10 more people to do that, which I don't have. So um, we'll, get, we'll get there at some point. Yeah. Um, let me just make sure that I uh, have answered. Have I answered all the questions, Cameron? Yes, yeah, so it looks like um, the radiology department also has a similar program. They're Oh, great. To collaborate. So I guess in general, oh, excellent. How, how would people at, you know, at other institutions reach out to you and um, you know, um, programs? Yeah, let me just put my info. Oh, I can't put it in because it's hosts and panelists. Um, I think, wait, 
I have one more slide and I think it has my contact information on it. Yes, it does. So if anyone on the call has any questions and wants to follow up on collaboration or you want to be added to our marketing materials or you just have some general good ideas about how to paint this program better, I am always open. So you can check out our website. So we have a website and our Four Directions program is actually on the website. It's cdi.brighamandwomens.org. You can email us at fourdirections at partners.org, or you can email me directly um, at tjelsimino at partners.org. So any and all communication is, is welcome. And I look forward to hearing from, from people as they have questions about the program. Excellent. Tina, very Great. nice to see you again. Thank you so much, Cameron. Good to see you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. It was really an honor to be here. Thank you so much.